We have a history of when there's been confrontation with whites, life or death, right? So for us, it, we, we're, we're constantly looking for a threat. Like I said, a mongoose and a cobra, we're constantly looking for a threat. I think that a response from some portion of the white population would be, we just don't all want to be seen as a cobra. We acknowledge that there are some different, some threats. Some, <laughs> we just don't want to be lumped into this. We don't want to be seen as this intentional predator of Black people in this country. The more we focused on who we think whites are and what white people need to do and talking about white people as if they have this identification, the more people start to feel that there is reason to identify as white more strongly. You strongly identify as black. I don't as, as the way you appear, right? I don't as the way I appear. I don't strongly identify as white. And, and so the question is, is why? Now there's all sorts of reasons why, um, but you, there was an experience that people had based on the color of their skin that gave them reason, and they currently, that they currently have based on the color of their skin, that give them reason to bond together, right? I mean, I mean, am I, you tell me, I mean, I'm, I shouldn't no, tell you right. whether they want to or not, because the other group is making is throwing them together. Correct. Right. Correct. So people get lumped together based on the color of their skin. They then have experiences that are painful, threatening experiences based on the color of their skin. And they say, oh, or they have really great experiences based on the color of their skin or great experiences. True. Great experiences based on the color of their skin. I, I have a question about that in a moment, but mm -hmm. I, of course, I agree with that. Um, and so they bond together. Well, what, what's the analog for white people? What's the way in which they were classified and lumped together? And I'm gonna focus on the negative threatening part, right? Where they were threatened as whites, right? Not as other things, not as Americans, not as some ethnicity, but where they as a group were threatened as whites. I don't know what the analog is. There was no, I mean, my, my historical heritage is different than a number of, right? I, you know, my grandparents were the ones who migrated. I have a short history here, right? Let alone that the fact that they strongly identified as Jews before white or American, you know, right? So, that was their strongest identification was as Jews. So my, when I speak as me, as being white, I understand that I'm, I'm different in that way. But just me as being white, what would be, even if I was here 200 years ago in being white, what would my kind of threat, what, was, what would be the threat to me as a white person? I would look at it slightly different. I wouldn't form it as an analog, but an opposite side of a coin. So right. you didn't have, the, so maybe the, this collective of white people didn't have some sort of existential threat coming at them as a group. Maybe some perceive that, but more than anything on the opposite side of the coin as a collective, they had a benefit that even by whether you strongly identified or not, you were enjoying. And as I hear you talk, you know, about, I mean, think about that sort of like white people are less likely to be taken in by the police when they're stopped. And even then, if they are taken in, they're charged with lesser crimes. Like there's all sort of, what, so I guess for the people who may or may not self-identify, whether, and as black people, we're not looking at the degree to which a particular individual identifies because you all are reaping the benefit of it, right? Yeah. So, you know, it doesn't, that that part doesn't matter to us, you know? So that's why we, we do harp on the collective group because yeah. we're not looking at necessarily your personal emotions, because your personal emotion doesn't matter. All that matters is that 
in a particular situation, someone, whether you want it or not, is extending you a benefit that they are likely to not extend to people of color. I've yes, been- yes. So you, what I'm what I'm hearing from you is that a reason to identify or to prop up your whiteness might be the carrots just as much as the sticks, right? The things that push you in that way, uh, that, that pull you towards a group just as much as they push you towards that group. And I, I hear you on that. Um, and what I'm suggesting is that my sense, my perception, my observation is that this trend of harping so much on people owning their sense of whiteness, right? And all the benefits that I'm going to acknowledge come with that, more so in some situations than others across the country, but in general, lots of different benefits that you've pointed out, you and I have both pointed out over the course of our conversations. It gives people, when people feel threatened, and I know you say lean into the discomfort, I've heard it from you before, I'm suggesting for that that for some group of people, that gives them another reason to identify in a stronger way with their whiteness. Um, and I worry about that. So I worry about the backlash of the focus on white identity in, to actually strengthen white identity because it makes white identity a thing I don't share culturally. I don't share, I mean, when I think about what is white culture, what is that? Like, can we even define guess, that? Can we what even define saying, what that is? What I'm saying is because of the benefit, that strong white identity is already there. Maybe, but don't get me wrong, I think the degree is felt in different white communities and friend groups, et cetera. But what I think what I'm saying is that it's already there. Like you're that you're that already that 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 strong identity is there. It's just being played down or played up at various, depending on the context, but it's already there. Mm-hmm. That we're that we're together because we're white. And what I I'm suggesting to you is that there are a portion of people for whom that is the case, strong. And I'm saying it's the case for all white people. Yeah, and what I'm suggesting to you is that I think you would be surprised to the the extent to which people do not identify in that way. They don't see, so I- That's why we're gonna someday have guests on this show so I can ask them myself. (laughs) <laughs> I disagree. Is Todd just an outlier? Either, either, either Todd is lying, right? Either, either. Yeah, it's like my friend said he lied. And either my friend lied, always no, said no, he no, lied. I'm gonna talk about myself. Either Todd is lying about himself, and he really did think about being white and is attached to being white or whatever. Yes. Or Todd is actually telling the truth. He really doesn't care about being white. Um, has not thought about it very much. And but he's totally wrong when it comes to other people, other other people who present as white. <laughs> well, that's why we need guests because right now we're, we're two very smart men in a vacuum, and we have to take the show to the people. I, and 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 just and, because I genuinely want to know, and you just exclude other black people because my own just feeling and sense, and like I said, I do have a, you know sort of you say uh, an adversarial mind is that they do like yeah. you know. They do. So, I mean, I hear what you're saying. I respect that as an intellectual point. I just don't think that's lived experience. Yeah, well, <laughs> I will. Here's where I will. Again, I don't know the percentages um, of people. And even if we get guests on, it's going to depend on what kinds of guests are we getting a real kind of that's true. representative population of, of, of is a, a guests that are representative of all the people across the country. What I will, will I, what I will share in support of your your sense of it um, is that when research has so I will I will support both sides uh, in some sense there has been research on the strength of white identity and it has been increasing um, in more recent times and that mm-hmm. worries me okay and some of the understanding of why that's the case is around idea of threat. Right, mm-hmm. um, threat based on race, and that's why I worry about some of the conversation because I have seen in some of the research that this is having an effect, and I worry about. Well, some of you, some white people have been going around talking about a race war. So I if you feel like there's going to be some sort of 
some sort of existential, because what I'm saying is that that's not necessarily coming from Black people harping on white identity, even within the, you know, the diverse community of white people. I'm using that word deliberately, diverse, to acknowledge not all. I'm, my mind is evolving. I'm a, just like I'm a host of this show, I'm also a participant in its dialogue. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, so the diverse group, but even if you have a minority saying, you know, there's going to be a race war, you know, there's going to be, and People can say things so often that it does make like, well, you know what? Look, if people start trying to do the fool because of race, they need to know I'm white. So don't shoot up my house. So this is why. So I'm going to I'm going to agree with you and turn the tables on you, mm-hmm. which is why there might be some number of people in the black community, bigger or smaller, who have views of who white people are based on the color of their skin and the view and and have assumptions about the way they identify as being white and the way they think about being black uh, a black a black you know the black population and the more certain conversation happens among the black population about white people the more that also right can change hearts and minds um so I think these are conversations happening on both sides, some of which are productive and some of which can enhance a feeling of threat and fear. That's all that I'm saying. And that's my worry. Yeah, but for us, it's more life or death. Like, so we have a history of when there's been confrontation with whites, life or death, right? So for us, it we we're all, we're constantly looking for a threat. Like I said, a mongoose and a cobra. We're constantly looking for a threat, and maybe that's a poor poor analogy. And and for you're making it, it real. You're making it physical. Like yeah, like because I really want it to be visceral, right? You know. So we, like I said, in as I was watching one of the episodes, I concentrate a lot on self preservation, and so you're if you're always looking for some sort of existential existential threat, you don't want. Uh, a dropping of the guard, if you will. You always want your guard up. Yeah. And so, so you keep language hyperbolic to keep people worried to keep the guard up. And I will acknowledge to you that both sides could do that. Yeah. And I will acknowledge to you that this is not an equal playing field, that the threats that are experienced on the white side are not equivalent to the threats experienced on the black side where those threats exist. So I, I, I can acknowledge that. that. acknowledgement. I, I I put that out there. Here's here's what I will say. This has been my hesitation. It's like a you know broken record. Here's, the hesitation is so even using your analogy of the cobra and the mongoose, mongoose. Uh, there are lots of mongoose. I used to live in Hawaii. Lots of mongoose is in Hawaii. Do you know they transported them there? They transported really? them, they transported mongooses. I feel like from like Australia or somewhere. Some place like get that. rid of the. I, I want to say it's like to get rid of like the maybe it was a rat problem or yes, some, I think so. uh, some kind of problem and mongooses just took hold because they don't have any natural predator predators in, in Hawaii. So you got tons of them there. Mm-hmm. Um, I hope I'm telling, I think it's the mongoose. I, hopefully I got the, the animal right. Cause I used to live there. It'd be bad, bad news if I got that wrong. Um, <laughs> anyways, back to the issue at hand, the cobra and the cobra and the mongoose. Now people gonna say which is which. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't go there, but there are some who might ask that question. And we're not gonna state. <laughs> <laughs> I think that a response from some portion of the white population would be, we just don't all want to be seen as a cobra. But now you've answered their question. <laughs> <laughs> we don't all want to be seen as a cobra. We acknowledge that there are some different, some threats. Some, <laughs> we just don't want to be lumped into this. We don't want to be seen as this intentional predator of Black people in this country. Um, well, then, I, and, and my retort to that, <laughs> my, my retort to that is, okay, cool. So talk to your people. That's To me, that's not a Black problem or a Black issue. That's a white problem. So if you don't want to be seen as that, tell these people to tone down their rhetoric and we will deescalate rhetoric as the same, like to use the analogy. So the mongoose is going to relax when the cobra goes to sleep. Mm. So I was, I was running a seminar. I was running a seminar one time um, around resolving emotions. And, Mm -hmm. and I asked the group, I said, 
And so we were working on on dealing with with anger. I'm not saying that's the only emotion here. You show, you've you've expressed as I have like a variety of emotions, but I'm just gonna mm -hmm. this is this is a real life circumstance. Yeah. And I said, is there anyone if we're gonna go through resolving anger, is there anyone for whom you would find it problematic to resolve your anger? And one person raised his hand and he said, "Yes, I worry about letting it go because my anger serves me. Mm -hmm. It motivates me." And what I hear you saying, put aside the specific emotion of anger, what I hear you saying is that the feelings exhibited or demonstrated in parts of the, the Black population, because it's not everyone, right? The Black population, just as the white population is diverse, right? Yes. That the feelings exhibited and the behaviors that, that come out of those feelings are that there would be a hesitation to tone that down to the extent that it would lead to complacency about something that needs to be changed. Yes, yes, yes. Thank okay. you for intellectualizing and articulate okay. the, the analogy. Yeah, yeah. The mongoose will relax when the cobra goes to sleep. Yeah. And okay. the cobra will relax when the mongoose goes to eat. Got it. And so... Now, just just again to, to to kind of go back to the to the other side of the ledger, which is when you say talk to your people about changing things, right? And I'm just gonna bring it up again. It's like who is the your people, right? Like again, I don't identify. Like I I don't I don't have this strong identity. I don't go around. And I go, get all of that, but by virtue of your appearance, you are. So to me, what I'm saying is none. Of, I get that, but that don't matter. But the, by virtue of your appearance, you are part of the group. Just by virtue of my appearance, I'm a part of the group. <laughs> I didn't create these rules. Talk to the <laughs> founding fathers. <laughs> Here's the distinction that I just think is really super important, uh, Andre. Um, in my in my in my feeling about this is that I just think there is a difference between how you feel you belong to groups and how people perceive you as being part of groups. Yeah, I can accept when you say you are perceived, Todd, as being part of a group and you benefit from that. And so you end that sentence. Do something about it. Right. Use the complexion that you have to advocate in such a way that change is made. I can, own, I can own I can own that. When. When the the the, the language changes to to insinuate that I actually feel that I actually am belonging to a part of a group. I, it's not that I feel that that's problematic, Andre. I'm not like angry about it. I don't, I don't feel upset about it. It just doesn't reflect my experience. There are people who claim their white identity, who are proud of their identity as a white person, as being part of a group that they feel they're a part of because of the color of their skin, that clearly exists. But for a large portion of people, um, there's just no there there in terms of thinking of oneself as white or bonding with people, other people who are white. And, and for those different. people, for that small amount of white people, for that larger amount of white people, <laughs> there lies the problem. There, there lies the problem. That's why. The, the, the problem, so without that connection, then without that connection, how long can the premise of their arguments last? And so it's easy to, in order to bring you all in the fold, you focus on, well, we got a common enemy in the Black people. And then if you play that up, over time, like your studies have shown, those who don't have a very strong white identity will begin to evolve into one because they're being told, well, because the person who's doing the telling and who's in their ear sees it as a problem that they don't have the strong white identity. So you, number one, claim the common enemy. Look, the common enemy is coming after us. And if you give enough hyperbolic rhetoric to people, they'll eventually take hold of it. And that's kind of what I mean is when you tell them to calm down, then, uh, then the opposite party will respond in kind. And so what I'm suggesting, I just think there's people who just don't buy. It depends, it dep it depends the extent to which someone would buy into that reality. Right. Right? 
I accept um, that. Like, I, I, I do agree that repetition does increase some people's accepting something as real, but there are just some people who are, who listen to that talk and they're like, are you like in a, are you like in another, I don't know, galaxy? Like where, where do you live uh, that I need to be afraid of some black community who's coming to get me, right? Um, so I, I would hesitate to just say that repetition is gonna create reality and then a kind of owning of, of the white identity. And it clearly does for some portion. And therein lies, and I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna go deeper with that because I think that's where the internet as a tool becomes pivotal. pivotal. So as you were talking, I was thinking like, what is some outrageous argument that people, you, that people on, with common sense would know is not true, that you could try to get them to believe is true. And remember, you know, maybe when you were a kid, your parents or adults used to say, the moon was made of cheese. Right now, we know intellectually as adults, the moon is not made of cheese. But what if someone put up a website saying, well, cheese is like, say, X percent calcium. And we've shown that since the moon is an offshoot of Earth, da 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 da, da that the moon is actually 40 percent calcium deposits. So if you look at that, then the moon is actually made of cheese. Now, what I just said is very simplistic. But if, if you were to dress that up enough and feed it to people in doses, not in large, but in doses, which is what Twitter does, then you, then you, can, you can change some hearts and minds. Agreed. Even, though, even though if you were to tell them the argument outright, the moon is made of cheese, people are like, no, dude, you're crazy. What are, what are you talking about? Agreed. No, I agree. I mean, that happened post-George Floyd, right? Mm -hmm. Um, there was a huge change in support of Black Lives Matter and some of the policies that are at least connected to the larger movement, whether it's connected to the organization itself. And over time, what wound up being shown in the media were snippets of violent, um, you know, riots or protests or um, reactions to the George Floyd incident or other incidents. And so in some people's minds, that then became reality. Yes. This is the reality of what's going on across the country. Mm -hmm. This is the reality of what some large portion of Black people are like. And, and to, so I hear you on that, right? And they give these little bits, little reasons, right? The, the calcium, right? That's a, a proof point, right? That's a mm -hmm. that's a support for the theory that the moon is made of made cheese, of cheese, right? And so <laughs> they give these little examples, and I guess the question that, and so I agree with that, right? And then in that context, in the context of all this information, right? Then there's some people who then look at their reality, and there's been research. And I mentioned this previously, and this is where I'm going to agree with parts of your thesis around, you know, whether there's the ability to move people to maybe strengthen their white white identity in some way or be worried as being a white person. Um, when folks, when research has looked at who went to the, for instance, the January 6th insurrection or who maybe supports certain, I forget what they were testing and I don't wanna be inaccurate, but maybe certain, who, who supports the idea or worries about certain portions of the idea of great replacement theory, this idea mm -hmm. that whites are gonna be replaced, right? And that there's some like intentional movement to do so. Those people who showed greater support tended to come from communities where there has been a decrease in the white population. So mm -hmm. where they are experiencing some decrease in white numbers. So they have their real experience of what's happening in their community. They then see whatever they see on social media and a story could be constructed in their mind that might have them feel threatened in some way, some reason to increase the strength of their white identity and their connection with other white people. So I, I, I acknowledge that that exists and happens. What 
I guess I would suggest or offer up is there is a possibility that just as this story of, well, the moon, these examples of why the moon is cheese, right? There's these calcium deposits, just as these little, these little pieces of potential proof can be thrown out there about what black people are like. What I'm suggesting is perhaps that might also be the case in how people view white people and their views about race and their identification in being white. Oh yes, these theories are definitely possible on, on for either for either group. I think the success of the theory depends on its marketing strategy. Well, what I'm trying to say though, Andre, is for for people who think that there is some prevalent identification with strong identification with being white among the white population, the cabal, <laughs> that that also could be exaggerated in one's mind based on data points, right? Um, just as whites might be dropped these little hints from you know entre you know entrepreneurs out there who want to stoke up white division, white, black, white divisions and mm -hmm. negative feelings between, um, between populations based on race, that, that the degree to which white people go around being, thinking about themselves as white and being attached to being white, or at least I strongly identifying with being white as some sort of group could also be exaggerated. Um, and I don't know, again, I don't know the numbers. I don't know how people feel out there uh, who, who, present as being white to to others i just think there's a lot a good number of people who walk around and just like me are just not thinking about it for better or worse thank you for watching this episode of healing race and stay with us for a scene from our next video if you want to see more conversations like the one you just watched please subscribe to our channel share this video with friends and family and like and comment on the video below. If you'd like to be a guest on one of our episodes and have an open, real conversation about race, email us at guests at healingraceshow.com. And if there are topics you think we should cover, we'd love to hear them. So please email your ideas to topics at healingraceshow.com. As always, thanks for your support. We look forward to continuing the conversation with you now Here's a scene from our next healing race. I know with respect to black women, because I have a lot of black female friends who are very close to me, like, you know, it sends a clear message when all the black men in your life only date light skinned black women. So, okay, like, you know what I mean? That like actions and words send messages, like they just do. And that that's hurt, that can be hurtful. You know, because yeah. like, like I said, because I mean, who doesn't want to find the one and share your life? And then you feel like that's going to be hard or more difficult than others just because you were born looking a certain way. Yeah. Really sit with that. That, it, that my finding a partner in life is going to be harder because of something I just could not control because I was born with a certain skin color. Yeah. It's yeah. hard. And that, and that hurts feelings. That's hurtful. That is yeah. hurtful. To watch the rest of that episode, go ahead and click the video below me. To see a different compelling Healing Race episode, you can click the video below me. We look forward to seeing you in the next video.